So good morning. Um, and uh, so in this lecture, what I'm going to try to do is uh, talk about larger scale variation events in in genomes such as the human genome, and um, to um, sort of illustrate the methods that are used to detect these. So. Um, uh, Michael did a great job uh, yesterday of showing uh, how SNP detection works and how important it is to get relatively high quality alignments in order to you know, be really good at finding SNPs. And uh, today I'm sort of going to try to do the opposite and say, well, you know, alignments are not nearly as important when you're looking for these larger structural variation events, although you still need alignments. Their quality could be a little bit sketchier. Um, so, um, so I guess to start with, um, you know, just uh, one slide overview of things which you probably already know, either from before or at the worst from yesterday. So uh, there is a whole bunch of genomic variation which underlies the differences between all of us. And this variation comes in many different sizes from SNPs which occur to one in a thousand positions and which can be detected by comparing a read to a reference genome and finding you know, things that look different. Ooh, we got a new laser pointer today. To um, larger scale structural genomic alterations. And these can be things like insertions, deletions, inversions, translocations, and changes in copy number of sequence. So, What are these structural variations? Well, these can be, you know, these are events usually which can be seen on a chromosome level under a microscope. This is, although people have been sort of, as the detection ability goes up, so is the, def the definition has also been expanding to include smaller and smaller events as structural. And people who have been working on structural variation for many years, uh, well, you're finding this 300 base pair thing. That's not a structural variation event. Only a thousand base pairs or more structural. Only ten thousand base pairs or more structural. In reality, I mean, there's obviously a continuum of, uh, of events from you know, one base pair to uh, millions, and uh, you know, there's really no single sharp cutoff which you can uh, talk about. Basically, to me, structural variations are anything which you can't find just by mapping a read. So, you take a read, you map it, you can find a SNP. You can find a two base pair insertion, four base pair insertion. But if you're dealing with a read of length 30, you can't find a 10 base pair insertion just because the read will have tons of locations where the two parts are spanned by a 10 base pair gap. Just the statistics are against you. So um, these are some of the sort of, um, um, these are some of the sort of. Uh, examples of uh, structural variation and how they can be detected via various kinds of experiments, either by sort of really looking at the chromosomes, like the inversion, this is an inversion of the chromosome, of the part of a chromosome 9, um, or using fish where basically it's the uh, fluorescent to label chromosomes and then take a look at them. For example, this is the common allele, you can see this is green, yellow, red, but there is also an inversion where getting yellow and green are in the opposite order. So this is a relatively rare version. There are also duplications where in one chromosome you have one copy of a certain sequence, and another chromosome you have two. It can also be something like 10 copies versus 12 copies per sequence. So and this is, these are copy number variations. And in general, so people talk about structural variation, and people talk about copy number variation. And uh, or people talk about insertions and deletions and talk about copy number variation as though they're two different things. Well, in reality, that's not true. There are copy neutral events like inversions or um, uh, transpositions when a piece of DNA just moves to a different location in the genome. But most events, insertions, deletions, insertions and deletions are also copy number variants. Deletions trivially. If you delete a piece of DNA, well, that's a difference in copy number. There used to be one, now there is zero. Uh, if you insert a piece of DNA, well, the genome is pretty bad at inventing new sequences. So usually you copy it from somewhere else. So it'll create a copy number of the sequence which was 
over which you which you ended up inserting. So the two of them are really two sides of the same thing. And uh, people will say, well, an ins insertion. Well, an insertion is really a C and B most of the time. So and I will use so when I explicitly look at copy count, I will use the term C and B. And when I'm just looking at in, you know, something happened, but I'm not sure what. I will call it structural variations, and we'll say there's an insertion, but I'm not really sure what was inserted. So, oh boy, okay. I'm going to blame this on Microsoft again. This should be on one block. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, what does a insertion look like? Well, you have a donor genome, and all of these will have a donor genome. This is a genome of some individual whom you're sequencing, and the reference genome, and that's what's uh, located at NCBI or UCSC, which you can download. And when you compare them, if there's an extra piece of uh, DNA in the middle, that's an insertion. Similarly, deletion is when the donor genome is actually missing a piece of DNA. Uh, inversions, you take a piece of DNA, and remembering that they're double-stranded, you go and you flip it, and you insert it back. So um, these are um, oh, right. uh, these are the common structural variations. Um, how do we actually find them? Well, there are various available techniques from you know, wet lab to sequence analysis. And one of the most popular is comparative genome hybridization, CGH. And what you do is you basically um, put your, um, make a slide. Uh, make a microarray, which will hybridize various pieces of DNA, and you put DNA from two, from an individual and possibly a pool of individuals, and see sort of which one fluorescently label them, and then see which one has is a, is more expressed. So it has m more copies in the pool. So mm -hmm. it will be you know go red, which one, green the other, and yellow more or less down. So that's one of the most sort of popular methods. This will tell you things which have changed in copy number, as long as the change is relatively significant. This will not be able to tell you 10 copies versus 12 copies. That's you know, more, it's just beyond the resolution of the microarray. A more, uh, this also cannot detect inversions and translocations, where a piece of, where these are copy neutral variants. So when there, there's actually no underlying change in copy number. Um, there's also fish fluorescent disease hybridization, which is basically an experiment to fluorescently label DNA and uh, actually look at it. Uh, unfortunately, this is very time consuming and expensive, and you have to really know what you're targeting. You can't just you know, look all, all genome wide for variants. There are also two sequence based techniques. The best one, and the one which is sort of most effective, is direct comparison of genomes. So if you're a really famous biologist, possibly you have your, your genome already assembled. <laughs> uh, it's uh, very expensive uh, to assemble the whole genome. Uh, it's, uh, you know, with the current technologies, as I pointed out in my previous like you really can't put together a genome from scratch. You usually work off of a reference. So uh, whenever you do this, if you're just doing assembly off of a reference, you find it's very difficult to assemble areas with structural variation where there's large scale alterations between individuals. So, you know, Levy et al. did a direct comparison of the Venter genome and then to be a reference genome to find structural variants. You know, unfortunately, that's not going to be practical as we're sequencing thousands of genomes with short reads. Uh, however, there's sort of an alternate technique, which is using unassembled mate pair or and pick or parent data. And I'm going to be using the terms completely interchangeably because from my perspective, they don't, you know, there is no difference. From the perspective of sort of the algorithms. So uh, using mate pairs to detect structural variations is much cheaper. You, can, you don't need to assemble the whole genome from scratch. And next-gen sequencing technologies make this even more attractive because you can get really, really high parent coverage very, very cheaply. So, how exactly does this work? So detecting variations make this. Well, first, you know, just to, you know, I guess I shouldn't have had the slide in here. You already all know what mate pairs are. You got three sequences. 
there's some insert size, you know nothing about what's in between. And now let's make, you know, for the biologist in the room, you will, you know, say this is ridiculous, but let's assume that the insert size is perfect. Let's say we know exactly the distance from here to here. What can we do with that? Well, it's pretty easy to detect structural variance then, because if you have the two reads, they're sampled from some donor genome. You map, oops, you map them to the reference. And if the map distance, the distance between these two reads on the reference genome is the same as your expected insert size, well, you know that nothing happened. Nothing, no insertions or deletion events at least happened in between. However, if there was an insertion in the donor genome, then the distance at which the uh, map will be significantly smaller. And furthermore, the size of the insertion you can estimate as insert size minus map distance. Okay? Yeah. Pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, this, by the way, makes the assumptions that uh, the assumption uh, the assumption that uh, uh, th th there's only a single event in between these two makers. Yeah. It's a somewhat reasonable assumption in most cases because these events which we're looking at are relatively rare. There's certain we have seen cases where that's not true, where there's multiple events actually happening between uh, between the pairs. Uh, Michael, yeah. I'm just wondering what happens in the case of uh, RNA replicates from cDNA? I mean, where the introns and introns come into place? So okay, so this is I'm talking about strictly about DNA sequencing. Okay. Uh, you people use similar types of approaches for RNA for finding uh, joint tra for finding transcripts of you know fused transcripts of various genes. Uh, also. Yeah, you, you can use the same, similar approaches for alternative splicing, but you know, in this in this lecture, I'm really concentrating on DNA sequencing, not RNA sequencing. And by the way, everyone, ask questions, please. You know, I we have uh, plenty of uh, you know, want to go through this reasonable clip, not not just rush through. So, so the second thing is, well, let's say we now see a mate pair, and we see. Uh, that supports some event that claims that there is some insertion happening. Would you trust that main pair? Or is that only evidence that you have? Hmm? One main pair. Uh, why not? It can be by chance. I mean, either from bad mapping. Or also, it could be that there is actually has been an, altera uh, an alteration of the DNA during sequencing. There is, a, you know, there there could have been a recombination event which happened during the sequencing process, uh, which wasn't in the original genome. So no, a single read you definitely would not think that would support um, uh, would support an event. It comes down to the fact that um, whenever you're looking for very rare events. You really want to be confident, and even small false positive rates blow up in your face. For example, in the example of, let's say there is a rare disease, which you know affects one out of a thousand people, and there is a test for it which has a one percent false positive rate. If you get tested and you come out positive, what's the probability that you actually have a disease? The disease, ten percent, because you know there will be if you test a thousand people, ten uh, ten will fall will test. Positive, of which only one will have the disease. So, so yeah. So when you're looking for really rare events, you want to be very confident. So even small fractions of errors will blow up in your face. So what you really want to do is you want to have multiple mate pairs which will support some event. And this is uh, explained by a concept called consistency of mate pairs. So two mate pairs explain the same event. We call them consistent in that case. If the size of event explained is the same, so the size of insertion for, by for x matrix x i is the same as x j, and they overlap. There is actually some sequence in the middle where there's space to do an insertion. Similarly, you can define the same rules for inversions, although it will be, become a little bit trickier. So imagine that there's a mate pair which maps into an inverted region. Oops. 
this is how it will map to the reference. Notice that the orientation will be wrong for the second read. But what about the distance between them? Well, actually, multiple inversions could create mate pairs with the same distance. Take a look at this. It could be as small as this. It could be right here, where the size of inversion is will be it's always, always smaller than m minus, the, where m is the map distance right here, minus the insert size. Or it could be as large as this, where it's, it's got to be smaller than m plus the insert size. m plus the insert size. Right. Could be all of these inversions could be explained by the same mate pair mapping. So there is a range estimate which you can come up with. The size of the inversion is somewhere between m minus insert size and m plus insert size. And here it actually becomes very important how big your uh, insert size is, obviously. If your insert size is very small, you can detect smaller inversions. So you can be more confident about your estimate of the size. Uh, furthermore, you can define the, the, similarly the concept of consistency, where these two mate pairs are cons consistent. They consistently explain the same inversion. If this map distance is the same, from here to here, and from here to here. And this is actually a little bit hard to see, but I'm actually looking at the distance between different, the reads of different pairs. So it's this distance, where these are different mate pairs, and this distance. These have to be the same for the two read, for the two mate pairs to be consistent. And uh, also the range of the size of inversion explained by uh, one mate pair should overlap the range of the size of the inversion explained by the other mate pair, and they have to overlap. Meaning this. So inversions actually create a rainbow-like pattern, where you know, where if in the case of insertion things you know overlap partially, it was like a chain. Here it's a rainbow. So that's you know all good, but. You know, as we all know, mate pair sizes are not going to be perfect. There's actually going to be quite a wide deviation between the smallest one that you'll get and the largest one that you'll get. So this is uh, this is just a diagram of observed uh, of observed map distances of mate pairs from uh, a classic paper by Tuzi et al. from 2005. Uh, uh, and what they did, this is with Sanger data. They looked at these and said, well, things which are here are going to be structural variants, you know, more than three standard deviations away from the mean. And things which are here are going to be structural variants, but things in the middle were, are not structural variants. And uh, while well, the question is, why are mate pairs which are right here any better than mate pairs which are right here? And the answer is, there is really no good reason, right? It's just an arbitrary cutoff. And uh, also by doing this, so I think the mean was around 40,000, and they went to 32,000 this way, 48,000 another. They were unable to detect any event which is less than 8,000 base pairs. Right? That's just the, the limits of the resolution. Uh, so uh, instead, of, in their case, they had a 40, 40k mean and uh, 2.8 kb standard deviation. And one thing to notice is that this distribution is completely not Gaussian or does not have any other sort of nice shape or form. You know, people sometimes as, say pretend that distributions of insert sizes are Gaussian. That's not true, pretty much. I, mean, I haven't seen one which is Gaussian. I've seen some which look absolutely horrible, which have, uh, which have really, really fat tails and look more or less uniform uh, up until they sort of slowly drop off. But I've never seen anything which even remotely resembles a Gaussian. This is as close to Gaussian as you will get. Well, why is this all important? Well, what if you really want to detect these smaller inserts, uh, events? Can you do it? And in the case of Sanger data, it turned out that you really couldn't. You were really limited by uh, the fact that you, you were really, these were pretty hard cutoffs. You couldn't go too much further in. But with um, high throughput sequencing data, you may be able to. So why? Well, first of all, you know, 
what if you have a small variation between the observed insert size of a mate pair and the, the map distance? So the expected insert size of a mate pair and the map distance. This can be due to two different things. It could be, well, this is just a natural variation, and this mate pair got sampled from sort of you know, further on, not from the exact mean of the distribution, but a bit closer to one of the tails. Or it could be, so that's noise, or it could actually be there's an underlying small insertion. How can we tell which one it is? Does anybody have ideas? No? Well, what data do we have? Make pairs. So, ah, if we have a lot of evidence, then we should be able to do better. At least that's a hope. So in reality, especially with high throughput sequencing data, you will have very high clone coverage, or relatively high clone coverage you will have, for every single potential event, many mate pairs which span it. So all of these should be mapped to the reference. And this is what we define as a cluster, sort of all of the mate pairs which span a certain location on the genome. Well, what will happen if uh, this area does not have an indel? You expect to see some observed distribution of insert sizes. And if, in fact, this area has no indel, the distribution which you observe should be equal to the expected. Your whole distributions should match. What if there is a 20 base pair insertion? Your whole distribution should shift. And if there is a 20 base pair deletion, the distribution will shift in another direction. So in reality, you're looking not at a single mate pair at a time, but you want to look at all of the mate pairs which could potentially explain variation in a given genomic region. So you know, can we somehow quantify what power this gives us? Well, it turns out that we can. There's this wonderful thing called the central limit theorem, which many of you probably learned in college and completely forgot since. Uh, so. If you have a whole bunch of independent random variables, and these are things like coin tosses or you know dice rolls, uh, with each one has a some mean mu and variance sigma squared. Sigma is the standard deviation. Uh, the mean of all of these will follow the Gaussian with mean mu and standard deviation sigma divided by root n. So it doesn't matter what the cool thing is. It really doesn't matter what the underlying shape of the distribution is from which you're sampling your random variable. Can be, it doesn't have to be Gaussian. It doesn't have to be any kind of defined distribution. Any distribution will do. And uh, if you're sampling things from it, the cool thing is your standard deviation, if it was sigma for the original distribution, it will become sigma over root n as the number of samples grows. So your standard distribution, standard deviation will get smaller and smaller as you get more and more samples. And this is exactly what we have. We have uh, different random variables, our sizes of indels supported by each mate pair. And uh, the mean of all of these is going to be normally distributed, sorry, the, the mean of all these is going to be an element which is randomly drawn from a Gaussian distribution for this mean and this standard deviation. So if there is some underlying indel size, we're going to get a sample from a distribution which is around it. We won't get the indel size precisely, but we'll get a very good estimate. Does this make sense? Some of you, hopefully. Furthermore, what this says is that you can actually compute p-values. You can look at a look and look at the uh, a proposed event and compute how likely is this to occur by chance. Well, this is exactly the probability that I sample the observed mean from a Gaussian which is centered at zero, indicating that there is no indel. Well, actually, not, it's not that probability to fail now. 
tail integral. This is exactly this gives you how likely is it that I observed this mean if there actually underlying there was no window. Uh, so it's a great question. Uh, let me uh, let me get back to it in like another five slides. So the question was, how do I know that I'm actually getting made pairs which span the symbol and not uh, this? And it turns out the, re the answer is that I, we do a lot of work in order to do uh, the trial possibilities. So, okay. So what is the key thing in all of this analysis that I've sort of left out? And uh, so this is great, right? It's, you know, it gives you a nice probabilistic framework for detecting smaller events. You know, you can give p-values, you can be very careful about your size estimate. There's a little bit of biology that I've completely left out. Sorry? Uh, sense and anti-sense, nah. Inversions, inversions are not, a, so inversions, we actually, this is not the way to do it. Inversions you just do using looking at specifically mate pairs which have opposite um, or mapping on the other strand. So in, this is just for insertions and deletions. Yeah? The size of insert might be, oh, well, it's not going to be constant, but it's going to be, we're assuming that there's a single library, so there's a single distribution. Yeah. Next slide is handouts, they're diploid. Yeah. <laughs> Next slide of the handout says diploid case. So all of this is great, but in reality, we have two copies of every chromosome. So the real world situation actually looks like this. You have um, two chromosomes, of which potentially only one has an insertion or a deletion. If both of them have an insertion or a deletion, well, that's just the haploid case. But in this case, the heterozygous insertion We'll have two chromosomes, which will map, and uh, will give you a cluster with two variable insert sizes. Hopefully, one of which will map the ma will match the reference, and one will not. You could have a triallelic case where neither actually matches the reference. So you have the observed distribution of matched instances from donor chromosome one which could be equal to the distribution of the insert size. But there's also a distribution of map distances from donor C2. So what you're really seeing is a mixture of two distributions, where the size of the insertion is probably going to be the distance between the peaks. So what you really need is these underlying means. Unfortunately, you have no way of knowing which mate pair came from which chromosome. How can you do this? Well, it turns out that you can do this by applying a little bit of smart computer science, something called the expectation maximization algorithm. And really, this is just a bootstrapping procedure which tries to estimate which mate pair came from which distribution. You start with two random distributions, or maybe they look like this. And for every single mate pair, compute, assign it to the two distributions with the probability that they were generated from the two distributions. So for things which are on the left, they're much more likely to have been generated from this, mate, this distribution than this one. For things which are on the right, it's the reverse. And for things which are in the middle, they could actually have been generated from either with some probability. So you do this assignment, and now you get a whole bunch of blue mate pairs which were generated, which are now assigned to the distribution mu2, a whole bunch of red ones which are on the first one, and now you update, you try to move the distribution so that they best match the mate pairs which were assigned to them. You will shift the distribution in this way. And then you will iterate this process. Again, assign the mate pairs to distributions, fit the distributions to the mate pairs, and so on. This is uh, a classic approach in computer science called expectation maximization. In order to update, we use something called Mogorov Smirnov statistic. It's a way of um, uh, it's a way of basically measuring distances between distributions. Uh, 
And uh, if you are really into this, I can explain why we use Pomodoro Smirnoff rather than something else offline. Uh, there actually is a really good reason to use this this picture rather than anything else. Um, nope, you do not assume anything about these are. You assume that you know the shape of the distribution, but this is an empirical distribution. You just uh, markers. You know, we have to, we we know the shape of the distribution, and we know their standard deviation. We don't know the, where where the shift is, but you know, let's say we have some distribution which looks like this. And then a second distribution, which is the exact same one, but looks like this. And this, you know, I mean, at any single point, let's say we have an element which is sampled from here. You can say, well, this has height, I don't know, 2, and this has height, 50. So with probability 2 out of 52 came from this one, and probability 50 out of 52. Well, no. So, yeah, so we the, sh the distribution shape is known. This is the distribution of the size of the insert. This is the empirical observed distribution of the insert size. Sorry? The sampling is so we assume that uh, so the sampling is uh, uh, with replacement. So because we sort of think that there is an infinite supply of DNA, this is not completely true. But how computation is in? Ah, very. This this whole procedure. So once you actually see where we run this, you will uh, you will see why it's very. Each individual step is not very intensive, but to do it over the whole genome is. Yeah. So no, but so basically the key is we assume we know the shape of the distribution, oh, but not but we don't assume what, that it's any kind of not normal closed form or anything like that. It's some empirical observed distribution, which we just get by binning things. Yeah. Ah. Uh, you use a piece of tool written by somebody else. It's, it's, uh, it's, so this is uh, taking a basically taking observed data and separating it into the two distributions is actually a, was the most algorithmically complex portion of this work. Uh, and you know, for example, if you're really interested in this, we'll be glad to provide you with our code for it. Uh, it's uh, all, the code for this is publicly available, uh, but. Uh, it's um, in general there is a whole sort of statistical theory when you have observed data which could be coming from a mixture of a whole bunch of distributions. How do you actually do this? It uh, originally was based on mixtures of Gaussians, uh, but uh, you can generalize it to any kind of distributions. So here is sort of the method we developed is called modal, which is mixture of distributions in the locator, and this is how you actually do this. So you start by mapping the rates. And you know we are very agnostic about what methods you use. And then this is where, to answer the questions of both the, comp the computational intensiveness and how do you make sure that you have only, uh, you know, sort of, you know that there's a single, uh, that you're looking at every event. Uh, here's how we define a cluster. We have a whole bunch of mate pairs which have been mapped. So a cluster is the end at the end of every single first read of a mate pair. This is a cluster. Oops. Then this is a cluster. Then this is a cluster. Then this is a cluster. And we run this mixture of distribution proce EM procedure for every single one of these. And this is what actually gets computational intensive. It's not any individual run. It's the fact that we do this basically as many times as you have mate pairs. Then we do this, we have a, some framework to take mate pairs which are assigned to non-unique locations and to assign them to unique ones. And I, I really don't want to get into this. Uh, and then we run EM for each cluster. At the end, we do some post-processing. We compute p-values for every single cluster and apply some global correction 
we usually use false discovery rate. Uh, merge duplicates. Because of the way we did the clustering, every single indel will be predicted multiple times at multiple adjacent locations. So we go through and merge these back together. And as well, for every single event, we compute the probability that it's heterozygous. Uh, I didn't go into this, but it's you know you can do this based on the observed distributions. You basically look at the two distributions and say, can I really be confident that they are separate, or could they, be, or you know, or is it likely that they're actually the same? How well does this work? Well, so to start to off with, you know, it's always nice to do a little bit of simulations to make sure that you are doing things which are reasonable. <coughs> so. We took, there was a study by Mills et al. a few years ago, which took all of the available Sanger data pretty much from every single individual that was ever sequenced at that point, mapped it uh, the, to the human reference genome, and found indels which were supported by you know, at least two reads from any individual. So this is a really good set of real indels. If you start to take a random, take a real human chromosome and start putting random indels in it, randomly inserting letters or deleting letters, well, you are going to get a much easier case than the real thing, because usually you will may, many repeats happen in already repetitive regions, so it becomes they're easier to find if you just randomly insert than if you take real ones. So we took the real ones, took 51 million maker, uh, from, uh, took these indels generated from 51 million mate pairs that were mapped to the human chromosome 1. Sorry, no, never mind. Took the real known mate pair, uh, indels and generated, inserted them into the chromosome, half heterozygous, half homozygous, and generated 51 million mate pairs with the expected distribution of insert size. And looked at how well our method does at finding these, um, finding these. And we measure two things called precision and recall. And you can think of precision as sort of like a specificity and the recall as something like a sensitivity. Um, in reality, they're defined slightly differently. Uh, but um, basically, for insertions greater than, and deletions greater than 20 base pairs, we were 85 to 90% on both accounts. So 85% of the true indels we could find, 85 to 90%, and 90% 90 of the things were found were true. Uh, and it's interesting to see that the numbers drop as you go to smaller and smaller indels because you can no longer be nearly as confident about your uh, about the fact that um, the two distributions are distinct from zero from, from the from the null, null hypothesis. Yeah. What would you expect for twenty two? Uh, twenty two. So for insertions, it's twenty twenty. So. Whenever we talk about these, we, we define insertions and deletions relative to the donor. So an insertion is a sequence which is present in the donor and not present in the reference. So insertions is 20 to anything. Deletions is 20 to 200. Deletion is 20 to insert size. Insertions is 20 to anything. Because uh, insertions, if you have an extra piece in the donor, You have an extra piece in the donor. It really doesn't matter how long it is because, uh, sorry, no, never mind. Insertions are to the insert size, yes, and deletions, yes, thank you. Uh, because if this is greater than the insert size, you will never be able to span it with the main pair. Hence, you will not be able to see it when you map to the reference. And the problem is that the insertion is the replication. If the insertion is a replication, wait till the next section of the slide, oh, of, the, of the lecture. So, uh, yeah. How long did it take to uh, I think two one million eight pairs wasn't uh, wasn't very long. It was oh, well, we did all this in the cluster, so this was just a few hours. Uh, the doing this for the whole and the uh, so this wait and another two slides now. The, 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 I'll answer the question which you wanted to ask. <laughs> um, so. You know, so this is sort of, and it drops off. And basically, below 10 base pairs, the method can't find anything. Um, we also did a comparison with a uh, another method, uh, which was just published, 
for structural variation detection, which looks at just the mate pairs which are significantly different from the insert side. And it turned out that we were really exactly the same pretty much for indels greater than or equal to 40 base pairs. But between 20 and 40, they found absolutely nothing, while we had pretty much the same performance, down to 20, 20 uh, base pair insertion deletions. Uh, for them, 40 was basically a hard cutoff. Um, and, you know, Mac and other sort of SNP tools like that, that, I mean, they're all fine, but at least I, I don't know about Mosaic, but with Mac, certainly we haven't been able to find anything greater than 10 base pairs. This is 35 base pair reads. Right, right, right. No, it's very Yeah, so this is basically, and basically I think the two sides are really going to merge, and they're already merging, because as the reads get longer, we can find longer and longer indels just by mapping. And uh, the mate pair methods are sort of taking care of the rest. So, you know, I think the two methods probably have already overlapped. With 72 base pair reads, you can probably get above 20 base pair indels. And m m methods like mobile can get it down to below 20. So, uh, this is the question that you really wanted to ask. We ran this on NA18507, which is uh, this. Uh, Yoruban individual, which was p published in the Bente paper a year or so ago, and all of the high throughput sequencing papers now use this as sort of one of the standard benchmark data sets. Um, there's 40 x alumina read coverage, the mate pairs were 208 base pairs plus minus 13 standard deviation. Um, this, uh, we ran this through modal, it took something like three days on our 200 uh, core cluster. So. A while. So, sorry? It's, it's it's computation intensive process. There's not much you can do about it. It's uh, oh no, no sorry never mind. There is a lot which you can do about this. Uh, my guess is that uh, we'll be able to speed it up about tenfold. Uh, and the reason is right now it's all written in Python. Uh, so for those of you who you know don't appreciate it, Python is probably the slowest language known to mankind. Uh, uh, so, yeah, uh, so we're right now actually porting it into something called Cython, which is uh, a uh, optimized version of Python and expecting something like a tenfold speed up. Uh, so, for this individual, there was a previous paper where they looked at a small fraction of Indel, found a small fraction of Indels. Basically, they were doing Sanger sequencing, also pair in, in order to define big structural variation. But in the process, by mapping the Sanger reads, they could find small indels, right? The, they were looking for big things, but also got the smaller reads, got the smaller ones where the read map. But the coverage is very small. It was 0.3x coverage of the genome. So you expect only a small fraction of the true indels. On the other hand, you do have some data set. And what we looked at, and this one, oh. Uh, Great, this one's just not showing up at all. Uh, so for greater than or equal to 20 base pair indels, we found 95% of the indels which were in the kit data set. It dropped, it was about 70% for 15 to 20 base pair indels. And this, we don't show it, but we missed 70%. So again, you can see greater than 20 base pairs, great, 15 to 20, okay, sucks beyond that point. You know, that's, I mean, that's, uh, you, you, this is what you get. Uh, another thing which may be interesting, well, we don't actually observe the insertion side. Insertion, we just get sort of estimate. It's somewhere in there, and here is approximately how big it is. How accurately can we predict the size? So what we did is uh, we took this MILF data set and took the insertions which we found in a different individual and compared them to the ones we found in the MILF paper. And uh, when I saw this correlation plot, I sort of wish that all of them looked like this. This is the predicted modal indel size versus the observed MILF indel size for overlapping indels. And uh, yeah, There's a, this is as good as they get. The R squared is 0.96. Uh, so you know, at the same time, you're saying, well, there is you know a bit of variation, right? You know, you're not getting it perfectly spot on. Uh, but there is a reason for it, and this goes back to the central limit theorem. Remember, we're not getting the true indel size. We're getting 
an estimate of the indel size, which should be normally distributed, Gaussian distributed, around the true indel size. So let's compare that, subtract one from the other. This is what you get, the gray bars. And in black is uh, a, uh, the Gaussian distribution with the appropriate standard deviation. And uh, the two are basically identical. So math really works. Uh, this, this was, this was you know, when I saw this, I was like, yes, this is spectacular. And uh, half my group are former theory students. And they were like, why are you surprised? It's math. <laughs> so I don't know. OK. And um, finally, I want to get into um, copy number variants. And this, you know, I defined, you know, I said before, structural variants are, and yes, so the slides for that are, were initially inserted into day one for in your folder. So it should really be in this one. Uh, so copy number variants are defined, as, the way I define them is areas where uh, regions that appear a different number of times within different individuals. So, for example, you know, it could be a duplication where this element got, well, let's say, retrotransposed into a different location in the genome. It could be a deletion where this area is missing in the other genome. And in this case, we're not going to be, we're mainly interested in estimating the copy number and not so much the actual sequence of events that happened. We just want to know. And this is important for things like, you know, figuring out the dosage of genes. How much is, uh, if, a, if a gene has a higher copy number, possibly there's a higher dose that, that's actually getting transcribed. So these are potential copy number variants. And in general, CNDs have been uh, associated with uh, diseases in um, schizophrenia, cancer, uh, other kind of, uh, you know, psychiatric things. And uh, in general, uh, so in this case, what the input is is a reference human genome and the sequence donor genome with just parent data coming from the uh, donor. And what we want to see is copy number variants annotated in the reference, finding regions of the reference that have copy numbers. So, and here what we're going to do is again, you know, use a little bit of uh, computer science, but we're going to use computer science, which you guys have already known. So we start by building something which is called a repeat graph. So the way a repeat graph works is you take regions of the genome which are similar to each other, and you merge them together into single nodes. So here you have red, blue, which is similar to something else, and you have green, which is similar to something else over here, which you can't see. You build initially a graph where every single of the, one of these elements is a separate node. And then you take the two red ones and you merge them into a single node. So this is something called a repeat graph. Uh, does this look at all familiar to you? This is basically the De Bruyne graph from last lecture, except for we have no longer split things into length k pieces. We just look at maximal matching pieces. This is pretty much this is identical to the De Bruyne graph. The cool thing about the repeat graph is that a walk on the repeat graph should spell the original genome. So you start with uh, here, you get into the red node, then into the blue node, then into this black area, then back into the red, into this black, green, and out. So if you build a repeat graph, you can always take the original genome and find it as a walk on this repeat graph. However, what we really care about is not the reference genome. We do this to the reference. We care about the donor genome, the genome which we actually sequence, and how it's different from the reference. Imagine that the donor genome has like an extra copy of this blue element, which is right here, right before the green. What evidence do we have how it's different? Well, we got mate pairs. So there'll be mate pairs which go from this blue region to this green one. And when we look at them from the perspective of the reference, this will be a out of whack mate pair. It will be way too far apart. 
Furthermore, if you consider a cluster, all of these mate pairs which span this breakpoint, you're actually going to get a whole bunch of them. And this actually is a signature that in the donor genome, this blue segment will be followed by the green one. This is, you know, this cluster is indicative of this. So you can take this, your original graph, and add an edge from the blue node to the green one. And similarly, you can do the same thing on the opposite side of the blue. So you'll find this cluster, and you will realize that from this black region, you can go to the beginning of the blue one. So from here, back to here. So this is something which is called a linking signature. It's basically using mate pairs in order to say you can go from here to over there. And this goes back to the question which I was asked earlier, what if the insertion actually is present somewhere else in the genome? You actually get these matching linking signatures into the inserted area and back out. Yeah? In this case, uh, when we are mapping the rate to the rest, right, it's just better place uh, randomly the reset of blue four times or in every place? Uh, it's a very good question. So for this, we actually, we put them in every single place because it's, it's better to have a false edge, to have a false donor, we call these things donor edges. These are edges which are not in the original repeat graph, but we infer them from the donor. Having extra ones doesn't hurt us nearly as much as missing ones. So in this case, we actually place them in every single location. There is, so the next stage of what I'm going to talk about, we actually correct for the fact that we're going to get overrepresentation. And that'll be, uh, that's an important sort of consideration. So, you capture the donor adjacency and you build this thing called the donor graph, which is basically the repeat graph with a whole bunch of edges which indicate adjacencies in the donor. And the cool thing about this graph is that not only is the reference a walk on this graph, just as it was in the original one, you just ignore the donor edges, but also the donor can now be, the donor genome could be generated by walking this graph from start to finish. So this walk would correspond to the donor genome. We can't actually reconstruct the donor genome. That would be de novo assembly. But what we can look at as to how many times do we expect a walk to go through a node, which is an easier problem. And these will be our copy number variants. So in order to do this, we rely on something called depth of coverage. And this is, this is related to the fact that areas of the genome that are present many times in the donor will be sampled many times. And if they're present more times in the donor, they'll be sampled proportionally more times. How much more? Well, consider some you know, segment of the genome. Wow, everything is missing from the slide. Okay, now this I'm definitely blaming on Microsoft. This is, this is absolutely nothing to do with it. Okay, I'll, uh, there was a whole bunch of formulas on this which are now completely gone. I'm sure all of you are glad to hear that. <laughs> uh, but uh, basically what it comes down to is when you have a segment of the genome, you can try to estimate how many times it was actually present in the donor by seeing how many reads are mapped to it. If it's present twice as many times in the donor, you should see twice as many reads. In practice, you can't get the number exactly, but you can get a probability distribution, which talks about how likely is it that this genome was present in the donor two times, one times, three, four, five, and so on. And this probability distribution is described by some, is, uh, something which is called the Poisson distribution, because this is described by a Poisson arrival process. Uh, this is, you know, I wish I could scare you with formula, but unfortunately, you know. Michelle probably on purpose took those, uh, these formulas out. Uh, uh, so when we actually want to call the CNVs, we actually want to try to find the path which best matches the, these distributions. So when we want to um, go through this node, this edge, 
but we want to go through it hopefully two times. You know, we could tolerate one or three, but these are less likely. So we prefer to go through it twice. Well, so what do we have now? We have this graph. We, have, we know for every single node how many times it was present in the reference genome. We have these arrival rates. Based on the depth of coverage, we may get something like, well, this should be, we should go through this 0 0.8 times, 2.3 times, 2.6 times, you know, things which are not very integral and may not actually match any given walk. But it turns out that we can find the path through the donor graph, which is most faithful to the depth of coverage, which most closely matches these numbers, using something called uh, uh, network flow with convex costs. And um, you basically get a single path rather than through this, not path, but you, don't, you get a path or could be multiple paths with the same copy count. And then look how many times it goes through each, uh, each node. This one it went through once, these two it went through twice, these two it, these it went through once. And here was present once in the reference, but twice in the donor. So this blue area is a copy number variant. So uh, this was a, 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 a probabilistic, there's a probabilistic model to score faithfulness. It's maximum likelihood. And uh, there's a network flow to find the most likely walk. Sort of, it's, it's elegant computer science. You don't need to worry about the details. This actually turns out to work very well. So we um, uh, took, um, the, we did the exact same genome, got 10,000 TMD calls, slightly more losses than gains. And by comparing, we compared the two previous uh, results. So for example, Kid et al. Uh, published uh, uh, insertions and deletions. So things which Kid calls deletion are almost completely covered by losses predicted by our element. He had actually pretty big calls. So sometimes we actually have some gains overlapping his calls as well. So I don't know if these are edge effects or why exactly this is happening. But almost everything he call he defined as deletion, we had the loss overlapping. Um, and just to give you an idea, by shuffling our calls, by taking our calls and moving them to random places in the genome, we get nothing close to that kind of coverage. It's, you know, it's a very significant similarity. Uh, <coughs> So we also compare to great the lecturer's phone goes off. Uh, uh, we also compared uh, the the results to um, database of genomic variants, which is uh, curated uh, in the adjacent building. In, well, actually, in this physical building at the sick kids uh, hospital at the laboratory of at, at the Steve Shears lab. And basically, almost everything we find overlaps with either a loss or a gain uh, in the database of genomic variants. The problem is we can't really tell losses from gains because they're doing losses and gains relative to a pool of individuals. Uh, or it really depends on the study, but usually relative to a pool, while we're doing it compared to some reference genome rather than to a pool. And again, after shuffling, you know, the database of genomic variants actually covers a relatively large fraction of the genome, so we get some overlap between sh randomly shuffled calls and what we observed, but uh, it's nowhere near the overlap that we got. <laughs> okay. Should have done this earlier. So, and then we did a comparison to a third study, but I will not dwell on this. Uh, so, take home points from all of this. You know, mo modal, you know, by taking advantage of high clone coverage, you can find progressively smaller indels with high accuracy, um, including 90% or more accuracy for indels greater than 20 base pairs. From, you know, we require about 20 clone, 20x clone, clone coverage of the data set. Uh, CNVs, you can combine pair end and arrival rate information to find copy number variants. And again, you see good concurrence with previous results. But the really, the really single take home message for all of this is for finding large scale structural variations, the key is parent or mate pair data. These are key to both to finding these events 
and also their accuracy is key to how well you can detect them. So uh, the length and distribution of insert size is extremely important. If it's too small, you cannot catch some of the events. If it's too large, you're likely to have a very large variance, which will prevent you from finding smaller events, even with an approach like modal, because there, what you actually, you know, there's two elements. There's, the accuracy is defined by sigma divided by root n, right? So if you get more of them, you get progressively more accuracy. More, if you get more makers, you get progressively more accuracy. But at the same time, if there's a higher deviation, then that actually that goes against you. And uh, in all of this, the, key, the interesting thing is read length is not nearly as interesting. For all of this, I've actually never looked at the underlying mappings. I just care that I can take a read and map it to the genome. So 36 base pair reads are perfectly fine for, for this study, for these studies. You don't need 72 base pairs. Uh, in order to probably capture the rest of it, you will need to go somewhere between 72 and, uh, you know, 72 so you can capture slightly bigger indels. But you really don't need to go to 200 long reads to find most of the events here. Although, one thing that we actually don't do very well is finding the exact breakpoints of variants. And then for that, you will, longer reads would be very useful. Uh, okay, so uh, I want to sort of acknowledge a whole bunch of people who worked on the stuff that I talked about both today and yesterday. Uh, so, Sun Kali, uh, as well as John Alcon, at the University of Washington, and Sergio Zomagliari at SFU, worked on the structural variation uh, side of things. Paul Nesbitt has worked on assembly for a while in my lab, and now is working on copy number variation together with Mark Hume, uh, Tim Smith, and Adrian Dalka. And actually, Tim, you're going to meet uh, relatively soon. Uh, he's going to be here to talk uh, to help run the lab on uh, assembly because he is the author of Adir, which is our color space assembly tool, which you guys are going to play around with uh, soon. Okay, that's it. I'm happy to take questions and then.